Got a question for you. How many people here have ever been to a Civil War reenactment? So growing up 20 minutes from Appomattox, Virginia, it was sort of a requirement. At some point during your elementary career, they were going to shove you on a hot bus and drive you out to a field that had a cannonball sitting in the middle of it and try to express to you the importance of that field. Now, that field's important because that is the field where the Civil War ended in Appomattox, Virginia, for all practical matters. And so to get the kids interested in the battle, because honestly, who cares about a field and a cannonball sitting in the middle of it? I remember vividly that when they brought you out there, they had little souvenirs that they would give you, and they would divide the group into half, and we would reenact the battle that went, well, actually it was the surrender that we reenacted. And you would do that because they were trying to reinforce the message. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do that in church? They're thinking, oh, no, he wouldn't. Come on, you know me well enough. He would. So I got to get you in the mood. So let's talk about the battle that we will be reenacting today here at our message time. This is what it says in Judges chapter 7, verses 19 through 20. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping their torches in, in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were about to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. This is the battle God called Gideon to fight. And again, the one we're going to reenact today. Okay, by the way, everybody gets to participate. Somebody said, oh, we know the kids are going to be the army. <laughs> oh, no. I got a much bigger plan. All right. But here's the thing that I got to do, and this is to help our kids. This is to catch you up on where we've been. This is actually week number six in this message sermon. So this is what the adults have been studying while you guys have been downstairs. First thing we learned is God desires a faithful relationship. This is all the way back at the beginning of July. Next, we learn that God sees you differently than you see yourself. That's an important lesson for us to remember. Then we talked about getting right with God starts with getting your own house in order. Yeah, I can't get right with God if I'm going to go focus on everybody else. Getting right with God means home. Then we talked about faith is about following, not signs. So if you're looking for a sign on how to follow God, then you're probably looking in the wrong place. It's about a relationship. It's about just following, not just a sign. And then last week, we talked about God's way looks different from our way. Remember, God, Gideon started out with the 32,000 soldiers, and God said too big, and he took it down to 10,000 soldiers, and God said too big, and then he took it down to 300 soldiers, and God said, just right. And well, today, we're going to talk about God's battle plan. Did you know God had a battle plan? Gideon didn't come up with this crazy plan of how he was going to go about defeating the Midianites. This was a God plan. And so the first thing that had to happen with the God plan is they had to be properly distributed. Now that just means split up. All right. So in verse 16, we're told dividing the 300 men into three companies. So Gideon had 300 soldiers. And now they're going to make them into a hundred apiece. And when they began to be distributed, we need to understand that um, you can't put all your resources in one place. It's an important lesson for us. You can't put all your eggs in one basket, is what my granny used to say. Remember, she used to raise chickens and sell eggs. So she, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to do things accordingly. And so God did not start off by saying, Gideon, take all 300 soldiers and go charging into the camp. He says, split them up. And, well, we must be sure that in our God-sized ministry, we cover all the bases. There, there's a lot of parts of church 
There's a kids' ministry, and there's adult ministries, and there's a men's ministry, there's a ladies' ministry, there's worship. And so all of this stuff costs, costs us resources. And so what that means, while we have but one goal, remember we talked about this last week, share Jesus, we can't be all in the same place at the same time. I know some people that have burned themselves out on church because they have thought, I need to be anywhere and everywhere, and every time the church door was open, they have to be there. So that is not the approach God wants us to take in our God-sized ministry. God wants to distribute the army. So guess what that means? If you're going to distribute the army, you got to have leaders. Because Gideon could not divide the army into three places, into three, and then just say, okay, you guys go do whatever, you guys go do whatever, and we'll go do whatever. He had to find himself some leaders. So in order to divide our army today, do you remember the draft? This was way back in the, um, the, the, the 70s was the last time it was used. It's where um, you didn't volunteer to go serve. The government just picked who was going to be in service. So I've got some volunteers that are going to be our leaders today. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh. Okay, Leah, it's your birthday. Please step to the blue line. There's one general. General Elsa, will you please step to the blue line? Come on. Come. You asked me to do this. Two weeks ago, you asked, you said you wanted to be in charge of something. <laughs> Never give me two weeks' notice. So, here we go. All right. So, they have to distribute. So, girls, this is your job. And this is not going to be an easy job to start with. You see all these people? So, I've got... Azariah, Emily, Lizzie, will you move over here to this side? I've got Lizzie. Um, Ma'am, I don't know your name, but would you move with my group over here? Okay, and I'm going to take Linda, and Lauren is with me, and move up, Linda. Come on, come on. And I tell you what, I'll take these three. Come on, Alice and Tori. So these are mine. You guys, get your plea. And when you're all done, Aaliyah, I want your group over here, and Elsa, I want your group over here. Get them split up, guys. Come on, y'all got to go. Come on, you got to move. You got to move. You got to find, get, count them. How many do you need? You got to get some people to go over there. Aaliyah, you got to get some people to move. Come on. Get them to move. Get them to move. Aaliyah, just look at them and say, you're over here. Just tell them to move. I mean, we got, we got one, two, three, four, five, that's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, go get them. Just tell them, move. Not asking, just tell them, move, and get them all together. Come on, just tell them to get all together. I'm sure if you ask these people here to move, a late Elsa, they'll move for you. Yeah, just get them all to move together. There you go, they'll move for you. <laughs> I want, I want, I want. All right. So you got it? They, they can sit in the pews. Just get yours over here and Aaliyah's over here. They can have a seat. Just get them together. We got to have them together. You're thinking, oh my gosh, Barry. Yeah, I've had a few weeks to think about what we're doing here. All right. So, and you may sit back with your group too. So we got them? All right. That wasn't too painful, was it? You're not done yet. We'll be back to you in just a minute. Um, you see, because after he got them properly distributed... He got them properly equipped. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. I would have loved to have been in the camp that night when Gideon got his, his groups together. By the way, can you now understand why God had to God-size the ministry? Could you imagine trying to divide 32,000 people by three? Yeah, they'd have never got it done. If, could you imagine doing 10,000 people by three? They could have never got it done. By the way, bud... <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to be the spectator. All right. So we'll talk about you in a minute. Um, but he took, he took and he got them all together, and then he decided that he was going to hand out the equipment. And the funny thing is, they didn't get a sword to fight with. That's what I would have given them, right? They didn't get a shield to defend with. I'd like to have one of those if I'm going into a bunch against not enough. Nobody refused to participate. 
<laughs> there were no bystanders. He had 300 soldiers, and all 300 had to go into battle together. That was God's plan. And again, now you know why he had to God-size his army. So, General Elsa, General Aaliyah, will you please step back to the lines? As of right, I'm going to draft you to make sure you equip this army over here. I'll need one back. Everybody gets a baggie. You know what that blue line's for, don't you? That's where the camera line is. <laughs> That's the camera line, so you're off the camera. All right, everybody needs a baggie. Come on, start going, guys. The adults would like to go home sometime today. Come on, start distributing your, your battle equipment to all of your soldiers. Everybody needs one. Come on. Did you get one? Okay. Aaliyah, you worry about yours. Let, you, you equip yours. Let Elsa worry about hers. <laughs> okay, don't blow yet. By the way, I make sure the trumpets work. I tested each and every one of them. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. All right. Has everybody got a little baggie now? So let's talk about, oh, are you going to come play? Come on. Right here, Elsa, Elsa, give him a baggie. <laughs> All right. So the contents of your baggie, did something break? Oh, one of them's not working. They came from Amazon. Blame it on Amazon. All right. So let's talk about what you got in your little baggie. First thing you got was a trumpet. That's what he got. Sherry, you asked for a trumpet, never be let it sit. I don't at least give it a good old college try. Now, if I am arming 300 soldiers to go fight against an insurmountable army, I would think sneak attack would be the approach, right? I would think you don't want to make any noise. You want to sneak up on them while they're asleep. You don't want anybody. But God says, here's a trumpet. And I'm going to get everybody to take... A trumpet. I'm going to be sorry I gave that to you. <laughs> Here's the thing that maybe you didn't know. All right, everybody put your trumpets down. <laughs> Not time to participate yet. All right, here's the thing maybe you didn't know about a trumpet. It was mentioned 52 times in God's army, in, God, in the word of God, and guess what? It always served the purpose of announcing the battle. When you ran into the battle in your, in your land against your, in the, an adversary who was attacking you, Sound a short blast on the trumpets. Please note that. Short blast on the trumpet. And you will be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemy. It's interesting. When Israel blew trumpets going into battle, it wasn't just so they could make noise. It was to announce God has arrived. It was to announce to the people, hey, look, this battle is over because this trumpet isn't so I can scare you. It isn't so I can play a song. It is to announce to you, God has arrived. So let's talk about the second thing that you got. Sorry, I'm working on the budget, so they're not clay pots. Dixie cups are a lot cheaper. Um, but you got what is essentially a clay jar. We're familiar with this, right? Now we have, a, have this treasure in, in clay jar so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. Now, they didn't have time. Remember, this group was out in the camp, and they didn't have time to run down to Walmart and wait for the smile box to come. Where do you think they got the clay pots from? They were just plain old pots. They were probably the things that they were using to serve their meals in or to store their food in. But to use them, they would have to empty them out, right? If you were storing something in it, you, you, they would have to empty it. And they were just plain old pots. They um, were kind of common. Nothing extraordinary about them at all. They were just what they had. The God said, we need clay pots. 
Then he's like, take what you got. Remember what God said? You're going to do this with what you have. Nothing special about it. Ultimately, they're going to break these. I know, you're trying to put out my eyes with that. That's why I didn't get laser pointers, by the way. Um, so that ultimately, they're going to break these as part of the battle. So that's the pots. And then they got a torch. Okay, sorry, I'm not giving anybody fire to play with in the church. I'm not that crazy. Dean, thanks me very much. And again, if you think about it, what good is this? Why take this into battle? I mean, it's not like you want them to see you coming, right? I guess maybe, oh, maybe they could have used these to set things on fire. I could do that. Not with this one, though. But this wasn't an offensive weapon. They weren't going to go around and try to burn them out of their camp. As a matter of fact, God says that all they're going to do is wave them. That sounds counterproductive, doesn't it? This is what the Word of God says. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. Jesus said this so that, so Jesus said this, then went away and hid from them. Isn't it interesting, in God's battle plan, what was going to happen is they were going to take and carry light and put a cover on it. And just at the right time, they were going to break the cover and reveal the light and shine the light. That's kind of a cool picture. What I've got is a trumpet to announce God is here. A jar, which represents us, the jar of clay, that's going to have to be broken so that the light can shine. That sounds a lot like our mission, doesn't it? That we're supposed to go into the world and we're supposed to announce God has arrived. (laughs) Not yet. Not your turn yet. My turn. (laughs) Then we are supposed to allow our lives to be broken before them so that they can see the light that God has put inside of us. Isn't that a cool picture? Isn't that just so very simple of how we're supposed to do this thing? Now, after he, this is why I didn't let you blow yours yet, because after he gave them the proper equipment, Elsa, Aaliyah, are y'all paying, y'all paying attention? Yeah. This is important, okay. He gave them the proper instructions. Watch me, he told them. So today I get to be Gideon. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. I and all who are with me, that's y'all, will blow their, our trumpets, and then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. We're going to make that last phrase a little simple for ourselves today. So what are we supposed to do? Follow me. So you're following the lead, Gideon. So Gideon's got his 100, and his 100's going to follow him, and and you're going to wait for your moment. And then he doesn't make this confusing. You don't have to figure this out. Do exactly what I do in the same order, in the same way, in the same process. And then he says, wait for me. So don't be rambunctious and run ahead. Don't take your moment before it's time for you to do what God has called you to do. And folks, that's called leadership. It's interesting. Gideon knew that he could not be the only leader. He had to get some other leaders. He had to teach them how to be leaders. Or this plan doesn't work. You know know how you know you're a leader? Somebody's following you. If you've got somebody in your life that's following you and following the way that you're doing things, then that makes you a leader. And it also makes you responsible for going in the right direction. So he gave them the order, and then he told them what to do. Again, this is not hard. Blow your trumpet. That's going to be the first thing we're going to do. And I'm not talking like, toot, toot, nuh-uh. 
I want you to get the wind in your lungs, whatever you've got, and I, and I want you to blow. Blow like you're trying to call God into the battle, because that's what you're trying to do. Then he says to break your jar, so you've got your jar over your light, and he says to break your jar, releasing the light, but get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as servants and the witnesses of what you have seen will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness and shine from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what we're supposed to do. Not just Gideon, that's our message. Allow ourselves to be broken. Then they are to hold high their light. So understand, you're not doing this. You're not trying to, didn't see that. What does it say? He wants you to hold it up. He wants you to hold it up. For God said, let the light shine out of darkness as shone into our hearts to give you the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. But I only gave you three pieces of equipment, but you know there's one more action, right? The adults are going to hate this. And this is why I kept the kids here, because the adults would never play. But I know the kids would. You know what the fourth thing they're supposed to do? They're supposed to shout. And I am not talking about one of those little shouts. I'm talking about one of those shouts that starts somewhere down in your toes and works up to here that you've got to get in the position to actually shout. God said, when you're done, I want you to shout. And the phrase they shouted was for the Lord and for Gideon. I don't know who added Gideon into it. Gideon probably added that for himself. For us, we're just going to shout one word today. Jesus. So, so you get what you're supposed to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through it for you. So we're going to start with our, and don't do yours yet, and so you're going to put that here, and then you're going to grab your trumpet, and you're going to go, ah! and then you're going to rip off your cup, and you're going to shine your light, you go, Jesus! That's what we're going to do. You're thinking, oh my God, by the way, I just crushed my cup. Hang on, I got to get my cup back. Okay. That's what we're going to do. So Matt... It's time to join the battle. Just so you know, I rigged this today. The flat mic that we use, you notice I just went up in volume. The flat mic that we use for the choir has been strategically placed pointing toward y'all. So at the moment that we do this, it isn't just going to be the people in this building that's going to hear you. This is going to go out all across the world. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? So you cannot do this sitting down. Everybody stand up. Everybody get their stuff ready. Girls, you probably want to get out in front of your company so they can see you. They can't see you sitting like that. So here's the way it's going to work. This group's going to go first. After we blow, this trumpet, this group blows, and then this group. You got it? They say, Elsa, Aaliyah, then we're going to take our cups off, then y'all take y'all's cups off, then you take your cups off. Then we're going to shout, wave our light, and y'all are going to wave your light, and then you're going to wave your light. And then we're going to shout Jesus, and you're going to shout Jesus, and get, kids, you have my permission, as loud as you can get it. <laughs> as loud as you can get it, all right? And then we're going to shout Jesus, and then we're going to finish our sermon at that point. So, are you guys ready? Yes. All right. Y'all got to get ready. One, two, three. Take off your cups. Wave your light. And shout, Jesus! Have a seat. Matt, cut that microphone off. Huh? No, there was no redo. Everybody have a seat. Now comes the hard part. By the way, if you're a guest with us today, yeah, sometimes we're this crazy. This is the way it works. So Matt, put that back in sermon mode. Mute that flat mic back because I don't want to be echoing for the rest of the thing. But I want to finish your story. And I've got a renegade over here. It's just the way it happens sometimes. You know what happened when they finished blowing their trumpets? 
and waving and breaking their jars and waving their torches and shouting to God. This is what it says happened. Judges chapter 7, verse 21 through 22. And the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. And the army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zerah, as far as the, brother, the border of Abel, Maloth, and Talabah. Now, I've heard this story told a bunch of times, and I read a bunch of, a bunch of concordances about this. And I want to let you know something. A lot of people say, well, when Gideon blew those trumpets and he shone those lights and he broke, the noise scared the Midianites to get to death and they turned on each other. That isn't what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, think about it. He's got 300 people carrying torches and they've got an army that was so thick it looked like a herd of locusts in that valley. You think they're really scared? It had nothing to do with the trumpet the cup, or the torch. Do you understand what it had to do with? They called on God, and God showed up. And when God showed up, it says, he caused them to be afraid. He caused them confusion. He caused them to turn on each other. And I think this is important to us especially in the world that we're living in, and everybody's got an opinion about how things should be done. Folks, in our vision, too often, we're trying to pick a fight, and all God wants us to do is shine our light. Too often, we're out there and we're trying to solve the world's problems with, hey, more laws, more legislation, more of this, more of that, more judgment. And Jesus is just like, hey, look, that's not what you were called. That's not the battle plan. I dare you to find in Scripture anywhere it says that's the battle plan. What was the battle plan? What is it that Jesus called us to do? You see, way too often, we just want to minister in quiet because we're just not convinced God will show up. That's what we do in the church. We just want to sit here and just kind of be small and be quiet. And don't draw too much attention to myself. By the way, I'd like to thank Elsa and Aaliyah for helping. Because that, I picked those young ladies because that is not in their nature. To stand up in front of people. I knew that. And a lot of times that's what we want to do. We want to do what's in our nature to do. And God wants us to be more than what we see ourselves. See, a lot of times... We need to remember our mission. God said, do it my way, and I will show up. And we know his way, right? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's what he promised. And when I look at Gideon and God looked at Gideon, he said, Gideon, 32,000 men, pay it down to 300. Okay, God, I'll do it your way. Gideon, put away the swords, put away the shields, put away the armor, pull out a trumpet, a torch, and a, and a pot for every single person. And just go do battle my way. Gideon is like, stupid playing God, but okay. We'll try things your way. And when Gideon did everything God's way, God showed up. And since I believe Jesus is God, and since these words that are on the screen right now came from Jesus himself, I can only conclude that if I decide in the church to enact God's plan, God's way, God will show up. Because Jesus promised. Hmm. So why do I struggle so much with enacting God's plan? Because sometimes I just don't believe he'll show up for me. So I start making my own plan of how to fix things. And trust me, I like to make plans. 
I do. I'm, I love making plans. I make plans on top of plans sometimes. Drives my family crazy. So, the masks. A few weeks ago, Namine came up to me before church service and said, Barry, what is with all the creepy masks? You thought I was going to forget that, Namine. Y'all need to learn something. I don't ever forget anything. So these two masks have dotted your um, bulletins and the screen for the last five to six weeks. And you need to understand where they came from. These two masks are actually part of Greek culture. See, I'm going to teach you something for school today, too. They're actually part of Greek culture, and they were associated with a Greek theater. They're as old as 500 B.C. that they've been using masks like this. And they are designed to show sadness and happy. The two extremes of human emotion. And a lot of times, this is how we minister. It's our emotion. However I'm feeling today is how I'm going to minister for God. So who is Gideon? You know the funny thing is? This is the last week of this sermon series. We've been looking at this man for six weeks. And I'm still not really sure who he is. I mean, is he the person sitting in the hole for God? Sitting in the hole for himself? Or is he the person that bravely went out and tore down his father's altar, an idol, and replaced it with a sacrifice for God? Is he is the person that questioned God with a fleece? Or is he the person that bravely took 32,000 men, pared them down to 300, and went to battle for God? Is he the person that went out there and did exactly what God said? He shined. Got myself backwards. Excuse me. <laughs> See? Got myself ahead of myself. Is he the person that set out in the tent that night? Remember, staring at the ceiling, wondering where was God? God, how am I ever going to do this? Or was he the person that went out and fought the battle God's way? Was he the person that later built an idol for the nation of Israel and led Israel back astray? Or was he the person that brought 40 years of peace to the nation? You know why I don't know who Gideon is? Because he spent his entire life wearing a mask. He never wanted people to see who he was. He kept putting on these masks over and over and over again, and it confused the world to the point that when we now tell his story, Gideon is not the hero God wanted him to be, but God used him in spite of himself. I never want to be told that, that God used you in spite of yourself. That's, that's a terrible thing to hear. So I want to close this morning by asking you a question. Who are you? Which mask did you come here this morning wearing? Did you get here this morning as you drove close to the church and you decided, you know what, I can't let people know what an awful week I had. So you pulled out your happy mask and you put it on and you came in with your smile and you came in with all of the things that you think people want to see in the church. Maybe this morning you put on your sad mask because things are happening in your life and you just don't want anybody to see that there's any hope at all in your life. You know, the thing is, um, Gideon never found consistency in his life because he had this up-and-down relationship with God. And I'm afraid that's what we do in ministry. We never find solid footing with God. So my question to you today is, are you ready? Are you ready to do this thing God's way? Are you ready to commit your life to a relationship with God? to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior and allow him into your life. <laughs> to go out and allow your life to be broken. I have no idea. My cup went way over there somewhere. Allow your life to be broken. And again, let your light shine so that the world can see who Jesus is in your life. Because there's only only one option that you have. If you choose not to do that, all you're doing is wearing a mask. 
trying to convince people that you are something you really aren't because your relationship with God never found its place.